So tonight I'm going to tell you a story and it's going to begin with a koan and first we'll just give ourselves to the koan and then the story. <coughs> and the koan goes, is a very simple ancient koan that just describes a way of being and it says freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds. Freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds. <coughs> so with a saying like that, <coughs> you can um, stare at it and think, well, what's that about? Which is you know, something the mind just does without asking for instructions. It just says, what's this? You know? and the other way to do it, which I would suggest, is just like, just feel it, let yourself be absorbed in that state of mind. Freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds. <coughs> and you know the way when, you know, I'm standing on a balcony and a raven comes down and just pauses and looks at me and goes on, but I feel a little bit of the movement of the wings of the raven, things like that. Freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds. And you can tell <coughs> freely, I watch the tracks of the flying birds. If you're working really hard at this, <coughs> that can't quite be the spirit of it. So you can relax into it and let the bird's wings carry you and the big heart of the bird and the sky hold you up. <coughs>
Once upon a time, a woman was walking home along a river path. The path was worn by many feet and it wound over tree roots and between trees. And she heard a baby crying. And she looked around and then she looked up and the sound was coming from up in a tree. And so she climbed the tree and there was an eagle's nest and in the eagle's nest there was a baby. And she peered over the top and it seemed like a strange baby but it was definitely a baby. And so she held one arm around the tree and holding onto the nest and the other arm. She hooked around the baby and grabbed the baby and lifted him up and then gradually slid down the tree. And she took him home and she raised him. <clears throat> and all his life, his hands were slightly clawed like bird's claws and his feet were bent and he walked slowly. And his face was a golden color and when you looked, when he was an adult and you looked full on into his face, you saw your own reflection. And he seemed to have an understanding of the sky and the spaces in the sky and have an understanding of the way and the way that everything, 
Everything you rely on, it really blows away with the wind. And everything you think is just a thought. And it too blows away with the wind, floats away with the clouds. And so he taught, he was moved by compassion for people, and he taught people this, and he became famous. And so <clears throat> naturally the authorities threw him in jail. And uh, he wasn't terribly worried about this because he then taught the jailers. And also he worked out a way through his deep meditation practice. He made a double of himself who went around still teaching in the streets. And, uh, and then the emperor heard of this and so the emperor took him out of jail and took him into his palace and he became the guide and teacher for the emperor. And this, the emperor was Emperor Wu of Liang, and he was known as he was known by a number of names, but one of them was the Buddha Heart Emperor. And he came from a, a royal family, not quite in the direct line. He was a general, and um, during a time of unrest, he'd taken over the the country. But under his rule, the country was pretty peaceful for those times. And, uh, and he really loved the Dharma and he always listened to teachers. And so he really valued the eagle found, eagle's nest found child. And he was known as Ji, the child, and the emperor made him a duke, Duke Ji. And Duke would teach the emperor, and the emperor then heard of uh, another sage called Bodhidharma, who's also a great ancestor in Zen. And he, he hadn't, who came, and he, the emperor had an interview with him, but the emperor did not understand him, and Bodhidharma left. And Duke G said, Your Majesty, do you know who that was? And the emperor said, No, I don't. And the Duke said, that was the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Great Mercy, carrying the mind seal of the Buddha. And the Emperor said, oh, I better come and get him back. I better send messengers after him. He said, even if you sent the whole country, said the Duke, he would not come back. And then, the, but the Duke stayed being the teacher of the Emperor, and Bodhidharma went off and became the ancestor of the Cohen tradition. And, uh, and his teaching was vast emptiness. So he and the Duke had something in common. And I do not know, not knowing and vast emptiness. So, uh, and the Duke would, he ate minced fish and he always saved a bit of fish and spat it back in the river and it became fish again. So, uh, and, uh, and he was such a reminder, and he could read people's minds and uh, tell them exactly what they needed to do, and which koan to sit with, important things. And so uh, the emperor decided he would have a portrait made of Duke Ji because he was such a remarkable person. And uh, Duke Ji obediently went along to the painter, and the painter got out the brushes and paint, and, Duke Ji sat down and then Duke Ji always had talons, really, long fingernails that were more like eagle claws. And he had this long, shining face and he put his claw talons and tore open his face. And in each gash there appeared a head of Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. And uh, there have twelve heads, actually and uh, one in each gash, so he did a couple of extra gashes. And then uh, the painter kind of gave up trying to paint him then. Just too many heads, too many mm -hmm. quite And then later on, uh, and the, the emperor <coughs> did some interesting things for an emperor because he, like, he was a vegetarian and um, he used to go and hang out in the temple. And sometimes he would, he would go in the temple and work in the garden in the temple. And he would uh, go, and sometimes he went and became 
a monk working at doing the temple chores and working and meditating with everyone. And then the court would, it was a kind of theater really, because the court would then give a lot of money to the temple to buy the emperor back. You know. And, um, and but then one day, um, Duke Ji said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow. And the emperor asked him not to, but the next day he disappeared. And that's as far as we'll take the story today. It is said that the, the uh, well, the only other thing to say is that um, <coughs> the Duke is said to have reincarnated quite a few centuries later to help one of the other great founders of Khan work. Uh, but that's a story for another time. So whatever part of that story touches your heart, or whatever fragment of that story, just sit with that. And if you're not, nothing particularly stuck to you, that's all right. You can just sit with, freely, I watch the tracks of the flying birds, and enjoy yourself floating around. Really, I watch the tracks of the flying birds.
Freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds.
have tea and then come back for a talk.
Somebody just sent me a letter, and that's the front of the letter isn't great. It's, like <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole, you know, art piece all by itself. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so there's a couple of things. So we started out with freely. I watched the tracks of the flying birds. You know. Um, and I like that. I like that little, it's just a, sna a snatch, it's just a line of a poem, actually. Somebody's enlightenment poem long ago. And, um, and I, I have that feeling, I like birds and I watch birds and, uh, or I don't know, I just hang out sometimes and birds are there, you know, <laughs> you know how that is. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, sometimes you, you'll be looking at something and you realize, oh, it's not out there, and the whole universe starts to open up, and you realize you're part of everything, and it's part of you. And birds are one of those things. I, I remember noticing that long ago when I was first meditating, that, um, oh, you can almost become one with the bird, one with the forest, but the birds were good like that. And it doesn't have to be a bird, but, you know. So, so there's, some, but there's something nice about the way when, you know, a bird lifts on the updrafts on the headlands or something and you feel yourself lift, you know, you feel uh, it's, it's all in the mirror neurons. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what it, whether it's in the mirror neurons or not actually, but you can feel that way, oh I'm I'm part of the mystery too, you know. And so so the story and then we went into the story of um, the right at the beginning, one of the origin legends of Zen is the story of Bodhidharma and the emperor and the duke. And Bodhidharma was this barbarian <coughs> who came over from tattoo pierced um, barbarian, um, came over from uh, India. And uh, by dangerous paths, you know, survived. And he had a meeting with the emperor in the legend. And he was. He was a highly trained meditator and teacher, and his his own teacher was probably a woman, a woman called Prajnatara, who was herself like a great figure, and sent him off to China to um, educate the barbarians. You know, and so in China, of course, he was the barbarian, so he's known as the barbarian. <laughs> and uh, and but he had a meeting with the emperor, and the emperor asked, "What is the first principle of the holy teaching?" And Bodhidharma said, vast emptiness, nothing holy. And then the emperor said, well, who are you? Standing in front of me. And Bodhidharma said, I do not know. And the emperor didn't really know what to make of that. And he didn't really find it interesting. And so he turned back and Bodhidharma left. And crossed the river into another kingdom and began his meditation tradition somewhere else. But uh, then the duke was there at the time, watching all this, and said, Your Majesty, do you know who that was? Who, do you know who that barbarian was, from the Indian dude? And, uh, and he said, uh, No, I don't. I don't know. And he said, That was the Bodhisattva Guanyin, bearing the mind seal of the Buddha. And so the Emperor felt regret and wanted to send him back. And, and, uh, and the duke said, well, no matter how, how many, if you sent the whole kingdom after him, he wouldn't come back. You know? Which is a kind of interesting point itself. You know, it's like, you don't have to get the past back. You know? and, and then, uh, so I, I'm interested in all these people. And, um, and finding about the duke is hard uh, because, um, anyway, but he, he was a famous figure, and there are all these like tall tales about him. But I, I like the story of this baby found in an eagle's nest. It's so great, you know. And his face was also apparently elongated and sort of golden in color. You know? and, and if you looked hard, if you looked at him straight on, you could see yourself reflected. It's a kind of teaching, and. Uh, And, and I like the idea too that he ate minced fish and he would spit it back in some back in the river and it would become uh, <laughs> it would become fish again. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And, 
And apparently he left home, you know, the, the, this smart woman adopted him and raised him until he was seven, and then he said goodbye and left home you know, and began teaching. You know. and, uh, and then he had all these extraordinary powers of seeing and feeling hearts and minds and, and, and was locked up and then freed, and the emperor took him in. So, um, and then he was there, the witness, and it was said that he too was the Bodhisattva of Kuan Yin, who's the Bodhisattva of compassion and wisdom, and so that's the Bodhisattva with a thousand hands and eyes. There's an eye in each hand, you know, and um, and sometimes has eleven or twelve heads, you know. And so there's a mythic thing when the, he sat for his portrait and he had talons and he his long face he just opened it up with the talons and all the all the different heads of the Bodhisattva of compassion and mercy and love really were, in, were revealed in his face. So that's why we don't have a portrait of Duke G. Um, and then the other um, the other interesting thing um, uh, the other interesting thing he did was he said, if you want to find the path, it's a path without signs. You go on the way without signs. There'll be no signpost for the path you need to go. So, and so that's very close. You can tell his teaching is actually very close to Bodhidharma. It's vast emptiness, nothing holy. And when you know something, you have really moved a little bit out of the freedom of the Tao, being in the Tao. So, you know how you know how when you write, you know somebody tells you something that you know is just wrong. Um, like, and uh, and so you tell them, and then they don't mysteriously don't agree with you, <laughs> and then and so you get some evidence and you write them a long email in the evening, in the night, you know, and tell them, <laughs> and, and then and then you realize that you have started to feel narrow. Mm -hmm. you know. That's why. What's the first principle? It's vast emptiness. You know. Even when you're right. You're kind of wrong, you know. Or, or it feels, and there, there are reasons to do this, you know, if you want to argue with people about, you know, not being prejudiced and, you know, climate change and things. There are good things to argue about, but it's a tricky thing because it makes you, it turns you into the guys you're trying to work <laughs> against, you know. So, so, so it's the right, and so. The other thing about the the Duke I like is if you thought you were weird, like, <laughs> or you look strange sometimes, you know, no chance, you know. <laughs> and so there's that thing about in 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 Zen, every being has Buddha nature. Like whoever you are, you've got Buddha nature. So you don't you don't you're never not included in the in the beauty of universe in that way. You're always included in the illumination. And you can feel it like every time you stop and really are present, or if you work with that koan, freely I watch the tracks of the flying birds and you'll feel that stillness and that spreading out spaciousness. Yeah, that's Buddha nature. Yeah, right there. And you can feel it. You can, And you look at somebody and you know, when your mind is at peace, you really see people, so you see their Buddha nature then, and you're resting in your Buddha nature at that time. And people look beautiful, right? You know? And you can see, oh yeah, everybody's got Buddha nature. Not just everybody in this room, but everybody you know, and everybody, you know, like that. So they, um, the, um, and it is said, um, yeah. Uh, it is said. Um, it, it is said that uh, Duke G um, became a. You know, he kept teaching after his death and would come back occasionally to assist people when they were setting up a new temple and things like that. So another fun thing. So. Um, and I guess I, it's fun sometimes to look at the, the great stories in 
in a tradition, in a great tradition. That the tradition is not just engineering and how to meditate. It's also the stories that touch the heart, and uh, and that um, there's a kind of dreamy quality about. They point to a kind of dreamy quality about living. That that. Um, You're, um, you know, it's mysterious what will be helpful sometimes. You get unexpected help when you weren't thinking of getting help, that kind of thing. Strange coincidences happen. And, uh, and so the, the story about the Duke touches into that mysterious quality of the teachings. And that, that in a certain way, when we rest in, and we enjoy the mysterious quality of life, then um, we'll be okay. Our feet will know where to put our feet as we're walking. So uh, let me stop there for a minute, and, and maybe I'll have more to say. But okay, wh where did you rest in the story? What part of the story touched you? Or and alternately, um, how was it sitting with the tracks of the flying, watching the tracks of the flying birds? Yeah, um, it's very interesting with the tracks of the uh, flying birds. What hit me immediately is words don't usually hit me, but they really, really hit me. And immediately I could feel emotion. Um, then there was this merging that happened with the bird, and I could feel myself feeling what a bird does soaring, diving. And then we just came to sitting. And as you were telling the other story, the, the bird kept like, I was, I was with, I'm the bird, but I, it felt like the bird kept looking at me even though it's looking at itself. So it's very interesting. And then with the story, the golden face really resonated with me. And when I looked at it, I didn't see my reflection. I just saw nothing like darkness. Um, and then the claw part really stuck with me and I could see the bird like it was clawing my face and where it like it divided me into fours and where I could in it it's like the messages that came across were taking a look at yourself from every angle and it was really something about flipping things upside down looking underneath, and then something about time and dimension. It was really fun. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think seeing things from another angle and upside down is that's certainly something the Duke is teaching people. <laughs> yeah. Buddy Dharma, too. Yeah, yeah. Try looking at it another way. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Anybody else? Yeah. I just sat. Um, yeah. I just sat with the tracks of the flying bird. And it was great because I've been lately. I've been kind of had problems, and I've been like much smaller than my problems. And right. <laughs> it was nice. It was sort of got me big again. <laughs> you know, this, this sense of spaciousness and freedom. And, bigger than my problems. <laughs> yeah, it's not, that's good. It's, yeah, That's why the wildness of stories is good like that, because it doesn't respect the narrow logic of the problem. You know. mm -hmm. One of the theory, you know, one of the Zen theories about the, the point of the problem is to make you feel narrow so you know you're a you. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I know who I am. I have my problem. You know. <laughs> Would you like to see my problem? <laughs> it's like my passport or my problem. You can present either at the border. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's nice. It's nice when it breaks out like that, isn't it? It's just like there's no good reason the problem didn't really change, but you changed. And, yeah. yeah, for, for now, but, the perspective is different. Yeah, yeah. So it's great. You know, and imagine like what's the most serious problem one could have? Maybe you're dying or something. So maybe it might not be. Might be fine. You know, your perspective is wide. You know. Mm. So. Um, so I, too, with the story really resonated with uh, the reflection in Duke's face and the Duke's face. 
and um, just it made me think about when when somebody is really feels listened to and empathized you then it's like seeing yourself in the person that's doing the listening and, and reflecting back so it's just a nice quality and this part of a story that um, well no the um, sitting with the, the tracks of the flying bird I was um, had a quality of kind of feeling the feeling flying myself and then I was had a memory of watching hang gliders as a child watching hang gliders off of Dillon Beach the dunes at Dillon Beach and um, this memory of playing in the dunes with my dad we would play a game called sardines mm -hmm. and there was something just lovely of, and I think it was also the word freely where this memory of my dad was very playful which is not a common way that I associate my childhood with my father mm. gift nice yeah, so empathy, what you see is empathy, in the, or the bit in the story where you get seen. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's nice, it's a nice story about sardines. <laughs> <laughs> and dunes. Because part of, we talk about identity, and part of the identity that I can experience at times is, well, I've done this, I've done that, my path has gone this way. What kind of legacy have I left here, and so forth? And um, the, the tracks of the birds, there isn't any. There's no. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. space. It's a, yeah. It just takes away all of that quest yeah. for identity in, in that realm. Or well, having to hang on to the who I was yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Um, yeah, nice. Yeah, watching the tracks of the flying birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who else? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Um, I, you know, I, I was in a group with a Rinpoche, and I was intimidated because the Rinpoche was like a big Rinpoche, and um, Rinpoche is teacher, right? <laughs> and um, so I, I like walk. We were sitting on a beach. You know, so I walked to the water because um, I put sand on myself because it was so hot, and I just wanted to wash the sand off. And the teacher came and sat next to me, and I looked up, and there was this bird <laughs> flying across the sky, and I, I was like, "Look!" <laughs> so like that had a lot, <laughs> a lot of um, significance for me that line. Because um, it's kind of a, is it oxymoron? It's like, I felt like um, I was so kind of intimidated <laughs> by the fact that my, and the bird kind of saved me. <laughs> it was like, oh good, I can just like let it all go. And, yeah, um, yeah. It, it's, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Yeah, teachers are not very impressed with impressing people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, for them it's like, can you go over being impressed so we can have a conversation? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so it's like that. So, and the bird helped, it seems like. Yeah, it opened you up. Kind of sweet, sweet story. It was a good, nice, it was a nice little meeting, yeah. like the, um, you know, I, I know the story, of course, of the Juke and the Emperor and Bodhidharma, but I, I, I know I knew the story about him being in the Eagle's Nest, but I forgot that they were the same person. And, and so it's kind of neat to, it feels like all of a sudden you hear a family story again that you forgot, and it's like, oh yeah. And the idea of it being, an, you know, in an Eagle's Nest, and it was 
obviously part eagle and everything really seems fantastical but a lot of the things we do in our practices relate to the animal world and it's kind of amazing how it helps because you know what I've realized is we're not really that separate from the animal world and when you start to relate to the animal world it things almost make more sense because the whole um, sort of drama is disconnected from it sort of just this nature this basic instinctive nature to it and also I remember I've been around a lot of different uh, conservation groups where they have these uh, wild birds that come in as uh, sort of icebreakers and to talk about it. And you look at it like a bird skeleton or like an owl, it looks like a little old man, you know? So we're really not that different from the bird world. And, you know, one of the animal kingdoms that I sort of relate to, you know, everybody wants to be this like really magnificent lions and soaring eagles and stuff. It's sort of a rodent, you know, small <laughs> rodent nice. creatures. And I was having to show this, this disagreement with my partner who had this expectation of something, I just couldn't see the division of what she wanted, was hoping that I would do on a regular basis. And then I finally just said, I'm just a befuddled mouse, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't get it. I don't see that division. And it just kind of just breaks it apart. Because how can you blame a befuddled mouse for not knowing this human division that you expected? So it's kind of neat to see how the animal world, you know, we're not that separate from it. So, I, I well, good like for it. you. There's something nice about the, yeah, well, there's the one side, there's the dr drama of egos, but the, I've always liked the, the, the modesty of the ordinary animal, you know, and uh, the, um, the big thing in the Haida tales, which I'm kind of interested in from up in, you know, the Inside Passage uh, in Northern Canada near Alaska. Uh, the mouse is 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 the woman who gives everything to the world, you know. She's um, she's this huge, powerful, hugely powerful figure, and she's a mouse, mm -hmm. and she's got and her, it's the storyteller said, and her voice had big round eyes. That's <laughs> 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 kind of sweet. Well, the other thing that's kind of funny, and I think about, it, I was talking to Jeff, and Jeff was saying how he people don't know Jeff. He's a, an artist, and he. To make a living sometimes has to be commissioned as a portrait artist and how when you're doing a portrait of someone no one's ever really satisfied with it because all of a sudden you're seeing someone as you see them which is never quite how they see themselves and it, it's sort of interesting that this guy couldn't his portrait almost couldn't be drawn because it obviously was so complex that it was just you know so it's kind of a neat thing that ability to see someone else as you see themselves especially if so I, that seems like there's a lot there, too. Well, given everybody in this room is Guan Yin, you know, and everybody has those 12 faces. And uh, you can feel, oh, that might help someday when you think you're in an impossible situation, you realize, well, I can't work it out, but Guan Yin might. You know. <laughs> it's like, I can't work it out, but the mouse will solve it. That, that, that kind of thing. It's kind of sweet. <clears throat> that the center, the center of that story is the part for me where Bodhidharma talks to the king and says, and he, and he says, "Vast emptiness, nothing sacred." Because I've heard that for like decades ago. I heard that Bodhidharma is supposedly the father of the martial arts. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but he, I don't even know if he's an actual historical figure. I mean, you would tell me. Um, but he supposedly brought yoga to China, and then yoga sort of developed into the, the martial arts. Yeah, well, well, Shaolin is the temple, you know, the relevant temple. And uh -huh. okay. Shaolin still makes its fundraising pitch off that, yes. Right. <laughs> off, of this, off of the blue-eyed barbarian that maybe doesn't exist at all. But... but um, and then you, you talk it about this in our hearts, yeah. right? Exactly, right. But then you talk about like you were mentioning these. Somebody says something that's not true, and then you're writing your dissertation to them in the middle of the night at, by email. Right. You know, and it, that's kind of where it hit me. Is is like you know, like you've got this vision of the way that things are, and they might not be true. And then you ask the question: Does it really matter? Because it's a fundraising pitch, and who cares? And right. 
Or you, you misunderstood me, and what I really meant was, yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> How's that go? Yeah, so the, all that sort of pleading cases and explaining things and so on, which is really a lot of what the mind just naturally does. And there's a real, you know, there's a place for it. Um, but it really isn't the fundamental thing, because the fundamental thing is that there's a reality vaster than our, sto our explanations of it, you know. And so stories like this point to that, I think, yeah. And uh, you, know, you know that thing about how, um, um, you know, sometimes when you really get mad about something and you write the email and it's always wrong to send it, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's just, no, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, don't even, don't even store it on your hard drive. Because it, it <laughs> it's just wrong, you know. And uh, in the morning, you know, the morning is wiser than the evening, you know. Mm -hmm. so, you know. And it'll just be a whole lot more work for everybody if you send it. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's what he vast emptiness, you know. Mm -hmm. The Duke said, the true path has no signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of... That on what you just said, the morning is more, is always wiser than the evening, is kind of where I was coming to, sitting with the flying birds quote, but not sleeping on it overnight, but just coming to that space in the, catching yourself in the moment. You know, it's kind of going between the dichotomies of what you were talking about. One of you was saying how there there are no tracks. There's the tracks are vast emptiness, um, and also the opposite. Where I, when you first said it, I s sat with, oh, maybe there are there could be invisible tracks. Or also it was interesting. Yesterday I was in Tahoe, I was in the snow, and I saw tracks of a bird that had walked through the snow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it was, um, and I also at the top of the mountain saw a seagull s s standing in the snow, and then it flew off into the sky. And um, so those two opposites, is, I thought of how the ones on the ground, or just in general, like habits that we have as creatures, or or as thought thought patterns and habits, they do the same thing every day, it can sort of create like a groove, like maybe a groove in a record, or a, Groove in the snow, and then things seem to follow by that path each time. But then, like if you flip that and have go to the spot where there are no tracks and there's vast emptiness, and also it's snowing yesterday, so if the snow covers the bird tracks, then you're back to the space of the morning is wiser when you are not in the groove of whatever. Habit of negative email. Um, uh, yeah, it could be. It can, could be even how yeah. how you see a friend or or a partner or how you see a kid or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. people get like parents and kids get into that. Like you're this way and mm -hmm. you need to change and stuff. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and so that's the that's the emptiness. emptiness like, some it's impossible to solve those problems by bashing, bashing at them more and so on. So it's the way to solve them is obviously it's empty. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. I like the calligraphy of bird tracks in snow too. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Some sort of conversation goes on with, through the bird tracks. Okay, um, I think it's time for. Um, what's the time for, Rachel? We do announcements. Very good. We could do four vows. Okay, I don't need to look at my. We. Uh, the thing I was looking for here is call. If that's an email that comes from us to you if you want to be on our email list. Many of you are, but if you aren't and you want to be, there's an email list over there. Spell your email address legibly. 
otherwise it will go to someone else. Um, and that's once a week. Um, they're uh, upcoming. Today's Monday, so the next thing is on Thursday from 12 to 1, we have a little meditation group in here. You can bring your lunch, um, and you can meditate and have a call, in and it's delightful. Um, and I think, actually, I may be here. I have been invited to. I used to do it all the time, and then I've been taking a break, but I'll be here Thursday, and I'll also be here Sunday giving a talk. Um, so Sunday, Sunday morning, 10.30 to 12. Um, and then next Monday, um, in that seat will be Corey Hitchcock, who got the flu last time she was supposed to be here, so she'll be she'll be here um, next week. And um, she's she's great. She's funny. She's an artist, great sense of humor, cartoonist, and is our membership coordinator as well. Um, if you want to see who that person is, actually, if you want to become a member, there's information in the back there too. That's that is one of the way we ways we make money. The other way is donations. There's this box that says donations and you put your money in the little slot, and then we keep doing this, and it's we're very grateful. So thank you. Um, oh, retreats! There are some retreats coming up. In fact, a, a few. There's uh, John Tarrant is doing a retreat in Bolinas. Um, starts on March 21st. There is unusually still room in that retreat, so um, sign up and um, soon because there perhaps won't always be room. Um, there is, are some other retreats at PacificZen.org. I'm doing a retreat in here on April 27th, so um, uh, I'm not sh that is probably available to be signed up for on SantaRosaZen.org and soon on the main PacificZen.org website too. Um, all sorts of other stuff, good stuff, go to the website. Um, and I think you have no questions, I will pick up the guitar and we will sing the four vows. <laughs> Is any, we should probably send, yes, books. Thank you. No. Ready? Just the vowels, you know. I don't know it's worth it. Everybody knows. If you don't know it, does everyone know it? Follow along. We do it three times. By the time you get to the third time, you will know it. We need little cards made made of it. You just make your own vowels up. All right. I think it's page fourteen. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Thirteen, fourteen. <laughs> Twenty-three. Depends which yeah, part. you're right. Page fourteen. Mm -hmm. All living things are one seamless body and pass quickly from dark to dark. We remember you who cared for us and are gone. You who are ill, you who are at war who are hungry and who are in pain. May you heal and have peace. We especially dedicate this evening to
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your. <laughs>